Okay, welcome everybody to another Lancer webinar. Today's topic is more features and functionality of V15. I am joined here today by uh, Edgar Wharton, uh, product manager here at Lanza. My name is Tony Graham. I'm the product marketing manager here at Lanza. And today we're gonna go over, uh, like I said, some new features and functionalities of Vigilante V15. We're first gonna do a small recap of uh, our last webinar, some highlights, some main features. And then Edgar is gonna get into some, some deeper stuff, some demos, and it uh, should be a really great webinar. So with that said, uh, thank you, Edgar, for joining us. If you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself and um, do some recap of our last uh, webinar, that would be great. Yeah, but uh, yeah, thanks guys for uh, joining us today. I'm excited to get into this. Um, but for all of you that are completely new, um, we just recently launched version 15 of uh, the Visual Lanza software. Uh, within the version 15 of the software, we put out uh, an immense amount of new uh, material that increases the productivity of Visual Lancer developers everywhere. Um, but one of the huge highlights within this is we're really putting a, a big focus in web application development. Uh, and through that, we introduced a, a, a slew of new uh, material design templates. Um, we also in provided uh, a new way for generating API code. Uh, that's one of our really big enhancements that we covered in our last webinar. And one of the great things about that is, you know, we took a lot of the guesswork out of it uh, for enabling you and your users to publish your own web APIs. Um, so for some of you existing users, uh, whenever you go to create a server module, you'll see a new area there where you're able to uh, use a server first server module to publish your own web API. Um, additionally, uh, we added in some new native chart controls. Uh, so we have included uh, a new chart library that will allow you to style and manipulate charts like never before. And we're going to be adding even more chart options as the year goes on. Um, but outside of that, we've added in a lot of more uh, productivity tools, um, some Git enhancements, as well as some tools to better present all of your YAML files and to load data from Excel, um, which is a really big enhancement. So uh, instead of having to connect to your database, uh, you can basically, you know, uh, put together an Excel workbook and you can connect that Excel file to Visual Lanza. It'll uh, generate Lanza tables. Uh, you'll get a preview of that data, and then you can begin building and prototyping an application in that way. Um, so that's just version 15 in a nutshell, and we have a lot more planned for the rest of this year. Um, we're planning about uh, uh, two to three more major releases for the year, as well as some more incremental releases. Uh, we also just released uh, EPC recently that has some additional API enhancements and some additional uh, fixes. Um, so yeah, please stay tuned. Um, so yeah, uh, just to kind of touch on this uh, a little bit more, uh, when it comes to, you know, generating uh, the uh, web APIs, uh, like I said, that code is generated for you. It's legitimately a three-step process. Um, so you are able to drag and drop uh, table and fill definitions onto the schema type. Uh, you're able to quickly put together uh, your security parameters for your API, and you're also able to publish uh, Swagger documentation so that your end users are able to see what fields are available for their consumption. Uh, all of that is very, very useful, especially within this day and age. Um, we are really coming into this, uh, into this time of being a part of a vast API economy, and being able to participate in that economy means that you are able not only to consume uh, the data that other people have uh, out there, but you're able to provide that data as well. Uh, can I get the next slide? Um, again, I wanted to point out the native chart controls. Uh, we did a lot of work to be able to provide these new chart controls to the tab. Previously, we were using Google Charts, um, but with the new charts, which are totally and completely free and accessible to anyone and everyone. Um, you have a lot more uh, design capabilities, uh, as well as, like I said, once we add in more and more, 
um, there'll be uh, the possibility of even having some Gantt chart solutions and so forth. Um, again, you can just drag and drop from the controls tab. Um, you can manipulate and style these any way that you need to. You're able to uh, add in uh, different animations and other primitives and uh, you're able to style those charts uh, however you please. Uh, next slide. And lastly, the import Excel worksheets. Uh, this one, like I said, this is a really amazing feature to have. Um, essentially, you're able to take an Excel worksheet and load that into Visual Ansa. Um, from that Excel worksheet, uh, you're able to select which columns uh, you want to have inserted as Lansa tables. And through that, you're able to prototype an application that you want to build. And perhaps this is something that you want to show one of your customers and say, hey, we can build this for you using uh, the system that we have. Um, being able to quickly uh, put together a prototype uh, such as that using you know, whatever data that they may have on hand without having to connect to their database, without having to sacrifice um, any of their security uh, is just a really great feature to have. And it ensures that you know, there's, there's this level of trust uh, between you and any of your clients. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the next things that we did, we did a lot of version control enhancements uh, this time. So uh, we have a YAML comparison tool and that displays the differences between uh, any two changes. Um, so we have uh, line numbers, indentation and highlighting. Um, we also added some new branch actions and that allows users to see all the local and remote branches uh, and view all the commits in the current repository as well as uh, being able to create, check out, merge, and rebase, rebase branches. Um, this is really all to allow more control uh, between just being within the IDE so that you're not having to switch in and out and move around into different places. And then lastly, one of our other big things is the event log manager. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out here is that, you know, this is something that a lot of people have wanted. And so uh, I'm really happy to say that this is something that we provided. Um, so basically the event log manager centralizes detailed event and error information for all visual Lancer related products. Um, so information is available for uh, main install deployment, uh, the Lancer web server extension, uh, Lancer integrator, open uh, runtime, uh, the web administrator, and the web function editor. Uh, so some of the things you can do is you can turn event logging off. Uh, you can limit the amount of data that is logged with each event log record. And if you need to, you can replicate a specific scenario. Um, you can erase the event log and only see information relevant to the scenario you are attempting to replicate. Uh, so with the event log manager, uh, you're, you're basically able to troubleshoot uh, any issues that you may have found within your application. Um, it's a it's a really great addition to uh, the debugging suite. And I, I really foresee us adding, you know, more additional elements to that as we move along. So that's really uh, B15 in a nutshell. And like I said, stay tuned. We're going to have so much more coming out over this next year. Yeah, and actually, I want to touch upon one thing before we turn it over back to you, Edgar, for the heart of the demo. And that's, uh, I touched about, upon this last week in, a, in another webinar, but we are proud to announce, we're very excited to announce uh, for Visual Lanza V15, uh, Seed Data Connectors. So these are certified Visual Lanza connectors, uh, all created by Seed Data. And Seed Data is a trusted name. They're a leader in database connectivity. Um, and so these are cool. They're going to be very fast. Uh, they have enterprise class security all built in and they are they are fully customizable and again you can build your own inside uh, you know visual Lanza. but what's cool is these are these are already done these are already ready to go and um, they are I would say they are for visual Lanza, right so so the C data created these and if you look at some of the the pre data connectors or pre-built connectors so right now there's roughly 200 uh, we're planning on adding like 10 to 15 every quarter and so these will constantly be growing. Uh, and if you look under the ERP, I mean, it's, it's SAP, you have Sage. So you have a lot of big names. Uh, same things with CRM. Uh, you got the Oracle Sales Cloud, Salesforce. Uh, those, are all, those are all pretty big, pretty big names. And we have some, some other ones as well. 
And then databases, you know, we cover Amazon, we have Access, um, SQL, Oracle. So there's also just um, a ton of databases with all these pre-built connectors ready to go. Um, marketing, so Google Analytics, Adobe Analytics, Google AdWords, you can integrate uh, seamlessly with all these things, MailChimp, Marketo, Eloqua, Magento. So uh, YouTube, again, all built in. Um, so collaboration tools. Uh, SharePoint, Microsoft Teams, uh, Magento again, Office 365, and then of course all your um, social media. So Facebook, Twitter, so uh, Slack. So again, um, these are pre-built, certified C data connectors. Uh, it's not just anybody. We're not opening them up to everybody. This is very specifically C data is creating these. And so these are very controlled pre-built connectors. Uh, so that means they're gonna be secure. That means they're gonna work with Visual Lanza. And um, so they're gonna be very stable. So uh, that's the last. A new feature I kind of wanted uh, to shout out before I hand this back over to, um, to Edgar. So Edgar, with that said, I'm going to hand this over to you and you can take over. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so one of the things we're going to talk about today um, and we're going to touch on from a, a fairly high level uh, is really the basics of consuming web services through Visual Lanza. Um, so we're going to touch on this from a high level today. And then in June, one of the things that I'm working on right now is building out a dashboard um, that actually uses a publicly available uh, data set uh, that has been taking in live data uh, for uh, COVID-19 uh, since the beginning. Um, it's a really amazing data set. And if you want to actually play around with it, it's uh, api.covid19.com. Uh, um, it's publicly available. You can uh, utilize it. It's, it's a live data set, which is really fantastic. Um, but one of the things I just wanted to point out with Visual Lanza in general is that um, consuming web services is very, very easy. It's fast and simple um, when you're putting this together within your RDML code. Um, it still uses that you know, component object model. And what that basically means is that uh, when you're defining your fields, when you're defining uh, your classes, and when you're putting together your actual requests uh, uh, to an API endpoint, um, you're still looking at things within that uh, component mindset. Um, so you're looking at things within being able to uh, essentially reuse them. You're looking at things within a productive mindset still. Um, additionally, uh, the methods that we have, uh, they correspond to the HTTP verbs. Um, so you're still going to be able to use your get, your post, your put, your delete. Um, uh, and also we have built-in classes that work with your JSON data. Uh, you're able to read and write your JSON data. You're able to uh, structure it uh, the way that it needs to be, the way that it needs to pass into other systems. Um, but also one of the really great things that I think is fantastic that we provide is we have a built-in class to build your request URL. Um, and one of the things I really like about that and I've seen previously in the past is that through this um, really what it's called uh, the URI builder. Um, through this, it basically just ensures that all of the query parameters are there for you. Um, and that you're not leaving anything out, um, which is just a really great safety precaution for you. Uh, next slide, please. So, and you know, just to point out um, some of the basics with consuming web services. Um, one, you know, uh, creating the server module. Obviously, that is one of the things that we really rely on um, very highly. Uh, the server module basically allows us to do a lot of the work uh, on the on on the back end. And when you're doing that, you have what are called our server routines. And the server routines are uh, a set of instructions that say, hey, uh, perhaps I'm using a Google Translate API and I want to translate English into French. Um, the server routine is basically saying that, hey, um, once I receive this information, uh, we're going to begin the process of translating English into French. We're going to translate this text um, from one thing into the next. Um, but also within this, 
uh, you're defining the fields uh, that the module will utilize throughout um, for the input and or for output. Um, and what that means is you are basically, uh, you're, you're looking at exactly what uh, needs to be defined uh, throughout, your op throughout your application. And you are utilizing that repository model that we have first and foremost, and you're utilizing the object model that we have. And when you're defining those fields, you're saying that, you know, X is going to be this. Um, and then you're also creating your server routines and you're instructing your program of what should happen upon the request. Um, and you're utilizing your reusable parts and you're utilizing your method routines um, to provide additional program instructions. Um, and so one of the things with consuming the web services that we have is we, you know, we realized that it was very important uh, that our users be able to do this um, easily. Uh, so when we came out with uh, the HTTP request class um, to invoke all of your web services, we wanted to make this very simple for all of our customers to be able to do. And, and really, if you have not gotten a chance to actually peruse any of our documentation, um, it's, it's a very simple thing. So you're ultimately, you know, um, defining uh, this class, uh, the primitive for the HTTP request. Um, and then you are, for the most part, uh, defining that, hey, uh, this is a Unicode string. This is going to be the response that I'm going to get. It's going to be a string. And you're going to say, hey, request get from this URL, and this is going to be the response. Um, that is the simplest of how these requests are going to go. Uh, however, today, one of the things that I'm going to show you is uh, Lance Exchange. And Lance Exchange is one of our newer templates. And I personally really, really love Lance Exchange because it's a really amazing template that utilizes uh, consuming web services at its best. And it shows both the elegance of the Visual Lance solution as well as you know how how challenging uh, it can be if you weren't actually using Visual Lanza. Uh, can I get the next slide? Um, so another thing that uh, we've definitely wanted to do um, is to make it very easy uh, for you know when you're going through and you're um, consuming any type of REST API is one, you have to be able to read and write JSON. Um, writing JSON mostly for publishing uh, or, or pushing, uh, but consuming, you need to be able to read the JSON values and you need to be able to parse those values out. So one of the things that's very important, <coughs> excuse me, is that uh, we have one, uh, the XPrim random access JSON reader, and that, uh, can get the value of any element that's located anywhere in the JSON string. Um, that's, you know, just a really amazing thing that you can do. Uh, and you, it, we have a whole set of different methods that you are able to use um, in order to read those values. So you'll see some of those methods coming up as we kind of just step through uh, some of the various aspects of the Lance Exchange server module. Um, so you'll see, you know, that you can read, um, you know, an object with path or with the name or at the index. Um, and these are just several ways that you can extract those values. And the purpose of being able to extract those values is that, you know, you may need to populate uh, charts, uh, you may need to populate forms, or you may need to populate different documents and things of that nature. Um, which is, you know, one of the things that I've been working on with uh, parsing out you know, different country names and being able to uh, take out um, certain information about uh, newly recovered patients uh, in country A during such time frame, um, you know, that is very important to be able to do when you're working with, you know, adjacent payload. Uh, next slide. Might just be the demo slide. Yeah. All right. 
So yeah, let's uh, take a look into Lance Exchange. Okay, I'm going to hand over control to you. All right. So, well, first thing I just wanted to show you guys, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, this is the uh, web page for Lance Exchange. And Lance Exchange is, uh, like I said, it's one of our new templates. And basically, it is a foreign exchange, a uh, foreign currency exchange, as well as a cryptocurrency exchange um, website. Um, basically, we are consuming uh, the endpoints from uh, the, I think it's the exchange rate API, as well as the uh, coin ranking API. So it's very simple. Um, I can put in, let's say, uh, two euro to the dollar, and then I receive my chain rate, as well as it's utilizing our new native graphing, and I'm able to see both the history as well as I can see the current exchange rate. Um, I can take this down to the seven day or use the 30 day as well. But what's most important is how is this happening, you know, underneath. So I'm gonna go over to my nice little beautiful Lanza setup here. We're just gonna take a look at the beautiful server module. So is everyone able to see my screen? I have a widescreen monitor. Um, Tony, do you have any issues so I need to enlarge this at all? Uh, you might wanna make it just a little bit bigger. I mean, you can see it, it's, uh, it, it is a little, little tiny, but I am on a little laptop, so but, uh, it's definitely seeable. Hmm. There you go. Okay, all right. So one of the things about the Lance Exchange um, and why it's one of my favorite, like I said, you're using the coin ranking API and I'm gonna focus on getting the values for the cryptocurrencies uh, within the exchange rate. And so, you know, <clears throat> when we are, you know, consuming any type of information from the API, first, we're definitely going to want to do this on the server side. Uh, which is one of the reasons why we we have this entire data server uh, with the Lance Exchange API. Uh, the reason that we're doing this is primarily because uh, you're typically going to have API key token pairs, and you're not going to want to have to do this and have it called out uh, from the client side application uh, unless there's uh, like a incredible valid reason to do that. Um, you're typically going to be calling and doing most API work from the server side of the application. Um, so um, before we, we jump into like writing any server routines or methods, um, what we have to do is, you know, we're, we're defining our requests. Uh, we're basically defining the different components that we're going to have to use. And we're also defining the fields that will be necessary. So here is everything that we have defined within the Lance Exchange. Um, these are all the fields that are necessary for this entire server uh, module. Um, these fields are going to be reused over and over again throughout the server module, as well as uh, they will be shown in some of the reusable parts. Um, and then from here, we get into the point where we start to define the various classes that will that we will utilize for consuming the actual API information. So the one thing that I'm going to point out, uh, continue with here, because we're running a little short on time, is so we're going to focus on uh, this one server routine, which is to get the currencies. So this is really like the base server routine that you need in order to list out the foreign exchange currencies and the cryptocurrencies. So as you, as you can see, we have a server routine set up, um, and it's instructing the program that we're going to receive an output of the foreign exchange currencies and the cryptocurrencies and that based on the subsequent programs that the component owner is to populate both the currencies and the cryptocurrencies. Um, and for all of you people that uh, may be new to Lanza, uh, a great little shortcut that I really like to use a lot uh, because it has definitely helped me within my learning uh, is just to right click to open the context menu uh, on 
uh, any of the methods or components that are listed out, and then you're able to see uh, the different uh, ways that they reference back to other areas. Um, and from here, you're actually able to see, uh, you know, go to view their definitions and so forth. So I'm going to look at the definition for the populate cryptocurrencies. Go to definition, and it's going to take me directly down to the spot where I have a method routine uh, that has been constructed where I'm going to populate the cryptocurrencies uh, for my program. Now, in populating the cryptocurrencies for my program, this is actually where I get into one of the first aspects of um, consuming this particular API endpoint. So, one of the great things about this, and like I said, uh, pro uh, developer productivity. So, Right here off the bat, we have request, do get, URL, com owner, get crypto URL. So if we break this down, um, we've already defined the class uh, HTTP, HTTP request. Um, this is basically that, request, and this is the HTTP verb, get. So do get, and we're gonna get the URL, and basically we're gonna get the crypto URL. This is another method routine that we have already defined earlier that contains the coin ranking, coin ranking API endpoint. Now, since we already have this already defined later on down the road, we can just call this here. And it simplifies the line of code. So basically, whereas many other programs will have, you know, this, this would essentially be another five to six lines of code we have kept this very simple. It's right here. And this is also, this is basically one of the reusable parts that we can call here from another place. So from here, we're actually going to check what the response status is. So um, we check the response status. We're like, hey, uh, is this a 200 okay? If this is a 200 okay, then we're going to go through and we're actually going to parse the JSON response. And what that basically means is we are going to pull out the actual cryptocurrencies from the JSON response. Um, and then we're going to check that. And then we're going to dump that into the results. And we're going to read through those cryptocurrencies. Now, one of the great things about this is like, like I said, it just keeps everything very, very simple and put together neatly. Um, so let's actually dig into these different areas of the JSON responses. So we're going to go look at check response status. So this is another method routine that we actually put together. So for this one, <clears throat> we are receiving a result uh, from the call that we made. And what we've done is we're using the Boolean primitive and we're assigning that to the name of result. And so, as we know, Boolean is true, false, so result is true. We have this field defined as the Lance Exchange result, and we want to know that, you know, is the response to the request successful? If it's successful, this is successful, that's fantastic, but if it's false, then we need to receive the error code, and we need to receive the error message. So, but according to our last script, since it was successful, it automatically goes to the next thing, which is where we come here and we actually parse the response. And so from here, when we're parsing the response, uh, we are just you know, going through a little bit of the same material. Um, we are again, checking that the result is true. If it's not, we're looking to see if there's an error message. Um, and then we begin the process of actually reading the JSON response. Um, and I need to go here. That wasn't the one I wanted to show you guys. Um, but whenever you're actually reading a JSON response, ultimately, uh, one of the things that you will be able to do is you're able to read that response at the JSON, uh, you're, you're able to read the response either by the path name, if you know the path, or you're able to read the response by the uh, element, uh, by at the object 
or there's a few other ones that you're able to start uh, reading at uh, for the JSON uh, object. Um, and what that does is it basically just gives you a lot of different options um, to where you can start to read uh, your JSON response. Um, and one of, the, one of the ones I typically use a lot is read with path, uh, especially if I'm consuming APIs, um, mostly because like it, usually I'll check the actual API call either using Postman or curl. Um, and then I kind of have an idea of what the path is going to be. And a lot of the times if there's API documentation, uh, you'll generally uh, know what the path API endpoints and what that path is going to look like anyway. Um, reading with name uh, is a really great one um, because that way you basically are starting with that first uh, name and then you're uh, able to start there, then you're able to assign uh, whatever comes after that uh, to a new field. And then afterwards, you're just going to end that object. Um, and then you have your data set uh, that you need to actually work with. So yeah, um, and really, like I said, this is one of the more um, complex examples that we have of consuming uh, uh, any REST API. Um, but it's also one of my favorite examples. Um, so like, like I said, when we were going through this one, this method right here, it just is going to populate uh, the cryptocurrencies. So when we come back over to the actual uh, site and we go over to the cryptocurrency tab, as soon as this loads, basically what that does to populate the cryptocurrencies is exactly this. Now, again, um, that's just giving you the Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tether, uh, I think that's Ripple, uh, Bitcoin Cash, and all of that. Everything else uh, is a whole separate uh, set of uh, methods and server routines. Uh, so when it comes to the icons, when it comes to, uh, or if it's a foreign currency, it, when it comes to the actual flags, those are a different subset of uh, method routines that would actually come under the server module. And would also come under, some of them will come under uh, reusable parts that we will actually be able to utilize throughout the server module and call. Um, but uh, it's really amazing just to be able to look at this and see how easy it actually is, um, one, to quickly and easily say, hey, I need to populate the crypto cryptocurrencies. Um, we can start from either the top level or we can build it up from the bottom. Um, but one of the things that works out really well is that there is an inherent sen uh, sense of referentiality uh, within consuming web services through Visual Lanza. Uh, being able to parse and read and write uh, any of the JSON web, uh, the JSON uh, objects um, is quick and it's fast. Um, and it's very easy to structure. And three, um, being knowing that you're able to check um, all of your responses, uh, very quickly uh, and reuse that as a method uh, is just something that, you know, it, it's outstanding. Now, one of the other things that I wanted to show you all uh, before we end this, and uh, some people may not have seen this yet, is uh, the package manager. So for anyone that's really interested in particularly um, playing around with different um, uh, web services, um, or just like testing the waters and looking at uh, what might be out there. If you go to the package manager, uh, which is tools package manager, uh, go to samples, there's an integration library. Um, in this integration library, uh, we provide some sample uh, Lanza uh, integrations. Uh, that you can actually utilize. Uh, these samples are just that, they're just code samples. 
um, for whatever you want to try out. Uh, uh, some of these uh, companies have free trials. Uh, for example, uh, Google Cloud, if you wanted to try out the Google Translate API, they have a free trial of Google Cloud um, where you can add the Google Translate uh, API service and you can receive your API uh, key token pair. Um, but clicking on this, uh, it'll take you to just like what our sample looks like. And then going through our documentation um, will take you guys to a download of a zip file and it will be a Lanza import file. Um, and then once you go to docs.lanza.com and just search for uh, the uh, consuming web services, and that should take you to a place where you can uh, download that zip file. Uh, and once you download that zip file and then import it into Lanza, uh, you'll actually receive a slew of files um, that you'll be able to uh, test out in the repository. Um, usually they will be under uh, XWS. And I'll give you guys a quick little sample of one of those. So my favorite is uh, the Google Translate. Always look at the modified date. I will go with the most recently modified. Um, so this is the Google Translate. This is one of the reusable parts for the Google Translate. Um, and in this particular one, uh, within the reusable part, uh, because what's happening here is that we are going to have a translate button. That translate button is more than likely going to be used in many, many different scenarios and many, many different applications. Um, so for this particular scenario, um, we are actually going to uh, set up our URL and this using the URI builder uh, primitive. And we're actually going to do all of our HTTP requests uh, through this particular um, method within this reusable part. And then we're going to actually call this through the server module as well. Um, but you guys will be able to utilize any of these and you can copy these over into uh, your, um, <clears throat> into the repository. You can copy these and you can play around with them, get a good feel for them, and actually just understand a lot more of how to build out uh, your own uh, applications that can consume uh, API information. Um, you know, like I, I was playing around the other day and uh, testing out, you know, taking in Twitter data. Um, but yeah, so it, it's, it's very, very simple to consume REST API data. And I can't wait uh, for our next uh, webinar next month, where we'll actually take you guys uh, step by step through consuming uh, data and then displaying it uh, in graphical form uh, of uh, COVID-19. But yeah, um, that, that's it for me. Okay, thank you very much. And the uh, Lanza Currency Exchange, that is, that comes, uh, that example's with V15, correct? Yeah, that example's yep, with V15. That, that, so you'll have all that uh, documentation, you have all those examples uh, right there for you when you download V15. So that's, okay, so first question. It says, um, will the event log manager provide details for exception errors in the IDE? Mm, for exception errors. I believe so. Let me, hold on. Okay. Uh, while you're looking at that, I'll... Yeah. Let, oh, okay. let, me, let me look at something right quick, because I believe so. I am not sure off the top of my head, though. Okay. And then it says, um, another question I got, it says, are these added functionalities documented in Learn Lanza or Doc Lanza? Are there examples as well? So the examples are shipped with Visual Lanza V15. And correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, Edgar, while you're looking at that. Um, yeah. And the plan is to get a lot of these courses once we get them more detailed into Learn Lanza. So they will be on Learn Lanza uh, in the very near future. Um, right now they are on docs.lanza and they are shipped with Visual Lanza V15. So you'll have uh, documentation in a few different places, uh, but eventually that'll all be on Learn Lanza. And so it'll be one spot for you to go uh, and consume what you need to, to, uh, to understand it a little, a little better. 
And then I think this one is probably for you, Edgar. It says, uh, how's, um, how's authentication authorization done when consuming a web service? Hmm. Yeah, that's actually a really good one. So, oh. um, no, no, that is actually is a really good one. Um, so uh, to kind of answer that question to the easiest of my ability, well, we actually use an OAuth2 uh, framework. And so basically what happens is when you are publishing a web service, uh, a lot of that is actually done through the, uh, not necessarily through the code generation, uh, but through our API definition tab. Um, within that, you're able to define what security requirements you have. Um, so you're able to decide whether, you know, it's going to be HTTP, HTTP basic, whether it's going to have an API key, um, uh, OAuth2, um, also OpenID Connect. Um, so those are the, the basics for the security requirements. Um, but beyond that, uh, you're also able to, um, <clears throat> You're also able to furthermore like generate a lot of those like the client secrets and so forth, uh, especially when you're going through and consuming that type of information. Um, also, if you want to go even deeper, um, there are some particular tricks uh, that have kind of come out and about um, when it comes to like utilizing session IDs uh, to particular particularly block other users uh, to add in ex extra layers of security. Um, but that's a good question. Uh, is that a public one? So, yeah, I just want to know if that, as long as that's not anonymous, I can get your email address and we can actually talk a little bit more in depth about that. Cool. Um, but in regards to the event log manager, um, so, where did that question go, actually? Because I wanted to reread it. Uh, event log manager. It should, it's in the open. It's in the open? Okay. Okay. So um, that one, I am definitely going to have to get back to you. And I, uh, did, I'm hoping that you registered uh, and put your email address um, because I can get back to you today. Uh, I'm not 100% sure about the exception errors. Um, but I can definitely find out and kind of, I'll test that out just to make sure and I can get back to you today. Okay. Okay. And then let's see here. Let me get back before we wrap things up, just a few other announcements. So I, uh, some, somebody already asked about it. Uh, so some people know about it. Some may not, uh, but we're excited to have launched learn Lanza this past month. And so, and learn Lanza is ever growing. Uh, it is definitely not static. We've already added a few more classes to it. Uh, so Learn Lanta is a comprehensive visual, um, visual Lanta, it's comprehensive visual Lanta courses and tutorials all in one. Uh, we have a, uh, we're launching a new trial experience. Now that B15 is ready to go, we are putting together an all-inclusive trial. So when um, you go through that trial experience, you're going to go into Learn Lanta and you're going to uh, follow that step-by-step. -step. It'll be uh, very nice for people new wanting to try it out. And you'll get a feel for how Learn Lanza, how Learn Lanza flows, and you'll be familiar with Learn Lanza once you convert over. You know, to when you when you purchase Visual Lanza, then you'll be familiar with how to go through all the courses. Um, each course has discussions. Uh, we also have a Learn Lanza community, uh, so people, that, you know, new learners can can discuss questions, and we'll be there to moderate it and it'll foster the sense of learning. So, you know, you're not alone or not alone with your company learning it. You have the whole ecosystem of, of Lanza and Visual Lanza with you. So if you wanna check that out, that's learn.lanza.com. And we're pre pretty excited about that. And that, like I said, it'll be ever growing um, as, you know, as new versions come out and new features come out in different EPCs, we will add those courses on Learn Lanza. And uh, this is currently it's, it's, it's free. Um, so I encourage people to, to check it out. And then um, lastly, uh, just wanted to kind of go over uh, Axes one more time. I know we still have some great pricing on it right now. And what Axes does, it, it empowers your workforce to access their 5250 applications anywhere because uh, it enables them, uh, web enables them. And so it takes your green screens and allows them to be accessed 
access, accessed <laughs> through any web-enabled device. You know, you can access your school files and your databases. And what's great about Axes is there's no coding and there's also no need to access your source code. So even if you don't have it, so, you know, with the, the pandemic and, and people having to work from home and, and the, that being extended for some people, this is a great way to quickly uh, enable your workforce um, to work from home. And the other thing that this does very nice is even if it's a green screen you want to convert down the road in Visual Lanza, you can put everything under one framework. So you can ac access your Axis green screens, web enabled, and your current Visual Lanza programs all together. So it's a great modernization tool. And like I said, if you want to find out about that, uh, we got some great pricing on that right now. Um, so I encourage you to get in contact with sales at lanza.com. And then if there's no more questions, I think we will wrap that up. So thank you very much, Edgar, for joining uh, us today. Hold, hold on one second, oh, Tony. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so M. Summers, uh, I'm typing you an answer right now. Uh, so I just kind of read that question. I think I misunderstood at first. Um, so basically, uh, when doing the authentication and authorization, uh, when consuming a web service, um, you have the option of adding um, uh, con uh, request headers uh, to your uh, request, uh, to your XBRIM request. And what you can do is you can do a base basic authorization. And so you can add a, something like a username and password or you can do an authorization using a bearer token. Um, so I did want to point that out. Um, and uh, M. Summers, um, I don't know if this person is still active with us. Um, let's see, are they? Yes, they are, okay. Um, uh, so uh, you asked, you, you said that uh, you, you thought that today was gonna be about uh, publishing web services. Um, Tony, uh, if you need to jump off, uh, you can, um, what I'll do is I can just kind of do this right quick. And then, uh, if, uh, you want to, uh, uh, M Summers, um, you can join us, uh, in June or I can email you or, or something of that nature. If we, if we have your information, um, but I can kind of quickly show you, um, you know, what we have for con uh, publishing web services kind of just right quick. Um, see so if you can see my screen uh, so uh, what we did with being able to publish web services is that we added some additional functionality to our code uh, generator um, so basically what you can do now is if you go up to the uh, file uh, and new so we within our server module uh, we have a new area where it says web API uh, so, uh, if you go to the web API and we have added some additional areas here and if some of you that, uh, are upgraded to version 15, if you haven't already, um, definitely add in, um, update and get the latest EPC. Um, so I'm just going to say demo server mod, uh, Demo five two six, and just gonna take a random table uh, from anywhere. So let's see, what table do I want? Um, we'll take this table from Use Cars, which is a new tutorial that we have, and you'll see that the object noun is automatically created. Um, and it'll use that primary table. Um, we also have the option of a secondary table to use as well. Um, but one of the great things is that now you're able to add in the optional security. So I can do a basic or I can do um, JWT as a bearer token. So I'm just gonna do a basic right now um, and I'm gonna generate the security samples. So I'm gonna go ahead and create and then that's going to run through in the background.